So today is the last day of the semester. No surprise, it's summer, sunny outside. So uh, there's not a lot of us today. Uh, but that's fine, it's going to be more interactive. We're going to take uh, more time for discussion. Um, so, as I promised, this day is special. We are going to uh, wrap up, we are going to play this game with uh, the Clicker app. And um, I also wanted to give you some bonus material, um, just because it's cool, and that's uh, page rank. Does anybody of you already heard, uh, did anybody of you already hear about page rank? Some of you, you know? Or, okay, so I can even make it fast. Um, so the idea is that you see the web as a graph with all, with all of these, um, the pages, with the links pointing to each other. And there's the notion of impact that a page has on another page, because whenever somebody links to a page, they are making a statement that this page is interesting. But of course, if somebody points to thousands of pages, the statement they're making about every page is weakened, because they're pointing to a lot of pages. So there's this idea that we divide the impact. For example, <coughs> if there's pointers to three pages for a given page, then it's one third, one third, one third, as a weight, you can see it as a weight. And then the idea is that you can see the whole web with billions and billions of pages as a graph, a weighted graph with the edges being bigger or smaller, depending on, the, on how it's divided from the incoming side. And then what you do is take a stochastic approach. You just surf the web randomly, throwing dices and clicking everywhere, and you look at how often are you on a page. And if you're very often on a page, probably that's a very good page and very popular. So this is what Google uses, or at least used back then, in order to uh, rank. So this is an instance of ranked retrieval. The goal is to rank results. We already saw plenty of ways to do ranked retrieval. We saw the vector space model, the probabilistic model, the language models. This is a fourth one, using this idea uh, with the random surfer. So for example, if you look at this, um, there's two po pages pointing to each other. So the probability over a long period of being on each of the two pages is? Yes? Exactly, 50%. You just keep alternating between the two. And here, what would be the probabilities? Does anybody see it? So you can see that you're, you have patterns like 2, 1, 2, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3. So half of the time you're on page 2, and one quarter of the time on 1 and 3, right? So it's deterministic that you're every other time on page 2, but 1 and 3 are, it's more random, right? So this is what we are looking for is this, um, rank here, x1, x2, x3. So of course you can already see the way it's written that we actually are using a vector of uh, weights. It's the probability of being on every page. And the idea then is that this vector, every time we pick, we throw the dice and surf on the web, we actually multiply this vector by a matrix. If you have this graph here, then the matrix is 0, 1, 1, 0. Do you know what this kind of matrices is called? That's a stochastic matrix. It's called stochastic matrix. Because if you look at a matrix like that, so every time you have the probability, so you were on page one, and then you are on page two. So these are the probabilities of landing on, certain, on a certain page, knowing that you were on the previous page one step before. Right? So why is it a stochastic matrix? Because we have probabilities that sum to, uh, to one uh, on, the, um, on the columns, but not on the rows. Um, so here is an example where this is solved. So we have the, uh, the final solution 50-50. And you can see that if you multiply this with this matrix, what do you get? The same thing, right? So that's a fixed point. That's exactly the idea of page rank. So now this is more complicated. You can see here how it's a stochastic matrix. Zero plus one plus zero equals one. One half plus zero plus one half equals one. Zero plus one plus zero equals one. 
So every time it sums to one, but it's not true on the rows. If it's true on the rows, that's called the bi-stochastic matrix, but we don't need any of that here. So every time you multiply, you build this matrix out of the graph of the web, so you don't know in advance the ranks of the pages, but you know the weights. You build this matrix, and you're looking for a fixed point. That's what page rank is about. So for example, in that case, this is the fixed point. We already saw it before. If you try to multiply this by this, you get exactly the same result, right? So this is a way more complicated graph. So you see we are starting to scale up. So this is the graph I showed you before. This is the stochastic matrix that you get, and we are looking for a fixed point. So of course, in general, we cannot just guess. We have to find out something. And the way we, did, we do that typically is that we are looking for a convergence. If the random surfer is surfing the web, we keep multiplying this matrix every time. And if we keep multiplying and multiplying and multiplying, at some point it converges to something. And this has to do with the mathematics, um, that if you have a limit to this, then the limit must be a fixed point of, uh, of, uh, of this operator. That's a mathematical, um, it's very easy to show. It's a mathematical uh, proof. So if we are looking for a fixed point, that gives us, there's two ways of comp uh, computing this fixed point. The first one is brute force. We kept multiplying, 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 multiplying. That's one way of doing that, at least on small data sets. Do you see another way of computing the fixed point of, uh, of a matrix like that? Maybe you saw it in linear algebra. I don't know if you went that far. Well, you can diagonalize the matrix, right? Because what it, how can you describe a fixed point with a linear operator? How can you describe a fixed point with linear algebra terminology? A fixed point is an eigenvector associated with the eigenvalue one, right? Do you agree with that? <coughs> Sorry. So the definition of an eigen um, of an eigenvalue and eigenvector is this: you have some number lambda such that when you multiply the matrix with the vector, it's exactly the same as multiplying the uh, vector with a scalar. If you consider lambda equals one, you get mx equals x. So I hope you agree now that it's all about finding the eigenvector associated with the eigenvalue one, or one such eigenvector. How can we do that? This is actually matrix diagonalization, right? So you can actually view page rank as a billion dollar worth matrix diagonalization problem. This is one abstract way of looking at it. So this is what I wanted to show you today. And uh, there is just a small thing that they then fixed, which that in practice, you have the problem that the web may be disconnected. You may have some islands somewhere and you will never reach it. So there is this smoothing factor that got added with 15% probability of getting to a random place on the web and 85% on clicking. So that's it. That's what I wanted to show you just to, um, to show you how linear algebra is so useful that even such a thing that seems so abstract as matrix diagonalization actually even has an application in information retrieval. Right? We already saw one with uh, inner products and so on, but also matrix diagonalization. So that's it. That was the, uh, the little bonus material that I wanted to, uh, to show you. And then what remains now is some wrap-up and a quiz. Um, I'll be very quick with the wrap-up. It's, it's only in order to freshen your minds. So we more or less went through chapters one to eight of the book, which is the basics. We saw, I actually forced myself to go fast on that. That's why there's the automatic transitions. Um, this is unstructured data. So we started with Boolean retrieval, where you output uh, a set of documents. What you want to do is index a collection of documents. So the documents have terms. And in Boolean retrievals, you're looking for these terms with Boolean queries. So we abstracted that as sets of words. And thanks to that, we get a matrix of Booleans that we convert into a standard inverted index, which is more efficient. We use the intersection algorithms, for example, for ends. Then, um, in order to construct the index, it's absolutely not trivial because there's a lot of uh, things in the process. For example, we grouped the terms into equivalence classes called types. 
So we have the, the notion of positional posting, which is one location of a term. Then there is the term, and then the type where we group like computer, computing, and so on. So one way um, to make it more efficient is to use stop words that we just ignore. Uh, one way is to use query expansion, where lift and elevator, for example, I shouldn't have done this uh, three second transition. Um, the lift and elevator can be, for example, consider equivalence either by expanding the index or by expanding the query. Uh, we saw the Porter stammer, which is a quick way of, uh, of uh, simplifying words, grouping them into classes. We had skip pointers, we had byword indices, um, we had positional indices where you keep the position of the terms, search structures, B trees and hash tables to look up the dictionary. B trees look a little bit like this. We had wildcard queries when you have the star in the middle, the permuterm index where you look at all the permutations was used in tolerant retrieval, k grams where uh, the edit distance, this is all used for spelling correction, right? The jacquard coefficient as well. The Sandex algorithm is also used for uh, spelling corrections. Then we looked into hardware. We looked into how, you know, how do we build the index in, a, in an efficient way? So we looked at the hierarchy of memory, the CPU, the RAM, the disk, the tapes. We looked into term IDs, which is a way of compressing the uh, term documents uh, pairs. Uh, we looked into several techniques for building the index. There was BSBI, there was SPIMI, which I always get wrong in spelling. There was MapReduce, yet another way, and logarithmic merging. These are four different ways. Logarithmic merging is online. It can be done live. Heap slow, we saw. There will be questions. Zip slow, we also saw. Um, we compressed the index in order to make more fit into memory. For that, we used variable byte encoding, we used the gamma encoding, there are so many techniques. Uh, and then we looked into ranked retrieval. Um, so the first try that we did was with parametric search, which has been very popular in libraries. Um, then we looked into term frequencies, document frequencies, and so on. We had to abstract documents as bags of words. And then what we get is the vector space model. And in the vector space model, documents and queries are vectors. And then all we need to do is compute the inner product of documents and terms, and that gives us a score. So what we do is we turn all of this into evidence accumulation, which is we reuse the standard inverted index, trying to accumulate the score just like that. What we are actually doing is computing the scalar products. The smart notation, you probably remember, is because there are so many combinations. Then we did ranked retrieval with probabilities, sorting documents by, by relevance. We use the Bayes formula for that. And surprise, surprise, we found out it's actually the same formulas for ranked retrieval for the vector space model. We also looked into language models. Um, and then finally, the evaluation of an information retrieval system. We looked into precision, recall, and specificity, the three measures that we had. We looked into how to Average PNR, precision and recall, but harmonic average. We looked into precision recall curves in the in ranked retrieval setting and ROC curves in the uh, also in the same framework, right? So all of the slides that you have seen, that's it. All of these slides are known to you. I hope that, right? Who already saw these slides? All of you, right? This is all, I just put it back just in order to refresh your, your memories with all of these things. This is just a very, very quick wrap up. And now we are coming to the, uh, to, the, to the quiz soon. What I would like to tell you is a little bit about the exam. So the exam will be mostly multiple choice questions, right? So multiple choice means it's going to be similar in essence to the clicker questions that I have shown to you or that we have used in all the previous lectures. Um, there is, of course, a few differences. Um, the first difference is that in the clicker questions I used, sometimes there was ambiguities or there was controversial aspects just because I wanted to trigger a discussion. And of course, in an exam, you don't have that because the point of the exam is to assess uh, your mastery of the material of the lecture. So it will be multiple choice. Um, mostly, there may be open questions where I, you ask for a, a bit more text or coding, but almost everything will be multiple choice. Um, there will be no negative points uh, to, uh, to the question, so you should always answer any question. 
The exam will be two hours and a half, but do not worry. This is not actually two hours and a half. It is meant as being a 90 minute exam, more like one hour and a half. But I don't want to be under any pressure, so you will have more time in order to proofread, to look again at your answers. Uh, so this is the reason for two hours and a half, right? So do not be worried about, you know, this long span of time. If you're done after 90 minutes and you're fine, then just leave, right? Um, then regarding the material of the exam, everything is part of the exam. The slides, um, all the, uh, the 14 series of slides, the recordings, because everything is being recorded, so you can rewatch the lectures all you want in the multimedia portal. You, you do have the link, right? I'm not sure it was on the website. Who doesn't have the link to the multimedia portal of ETH? Okay, so I, I will arrange that we put the link on the website. Uh, it's all recorded by ETH. You can watch them again all you want. Um, then there is the textbook. This is extremely important, the textbook, because um, there are several ways, several styles of teaching. Um, some people like to teach by having all the material on the slides, and that's it. Um, I like to have the book as a reference. I'm giving you exactly the chapters of the book. It's one to eight, plus parts of 11, parts of 12. That's what it is. This is the, 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 um, the complete uh, set of material, but in the slides, I may not have discussed everything that there is in the book, right? Because for me, the point of the lecture, the point of the slides, is to give you the big vision, the, the distance to, to, the, uh, to the material of the course, right? So that you have a global understanding of everything. But there may be additional things in the book that are also exam material, right? So it's not the entire book, again, just chapters 1 to 8 and parts of 11 and 15. Um, and then we have the exercises. So what I hope was very useful was the practical exercises, because we had a lot of programming with Python in Jupyter Notebooks, where you implemented a lot of the algorithms that we saw. Um, who overall found it useful to understand the, the material to program? Right, very good. So programming is, is often a great way of checking if you truly understood something, because you realize it quickly. If you didn't actually understand it, then there is no way you can program it, right? So the practical exercises are really here as a support to make sure that you absolutely understand what you implemented. But of course, what you implemented was covered in the lecture and in the book. So you see this is all complementary. There are several angles uh, to the same things. Then you also had theoretical exercises. Uh, that accompanied the lectures. Some of them were complementary to the, uh, to the practical exercises. Uh, you also had the week with probabilistic retrieval with the Bayes formula that was uh, only theoretical. And finally, there are the clicker questions that are used in the, uh, in the lecture in order to, uh, to activate uh, your knowledge and to, to make you think a little bit and make the course more interactive. So all of this is material for the exam. Um, there will be, after the course, an FAQ session. In, uh, only David is basically hosting an exercise session. Uh, I didn't manage to figure out his room. Does anybody have uh, the room? Is somebody with David? Yes? CHN, and I'm missing the letter? CHN G22, right? Okay, I'm going to write that. So in CHN G22, because enough of you expressed interest. Go there at 11, it's just an FAQ session. If you have any questions, you can ask him. You can also ask me, of course, and you can send emails at any time if you have anything, right? But this is one of the opportunities you have to, uh, to ask questions. Um, that's pretty much it, actually. So let's just start training and use this uh, game, this quiz, in order to, uh, to play a little bit. So I have organized a few questions. Um, even if we have a winner because it, before it's all done, we will still finish, right? So we'll go through all the questions. Um, I have actually brought some chocolate for whoever wins at the end, right here from Hausaman, right at the corner. So take your smartphones, start the clicker app, and we are going to go through um, all of these questions. So who is ready? Not ready yet? 
Not ready? Not yet. I'm waiting. Let me start the first question. I will not limit the time. Some of the questions, by the way, you already saw. Some of them are completely new. So it's a, it's a mix of the two. So maybe I should zoom out a little bit. So the first question is, how does the number of terms grow with the number of documents in practice? Oh, by the way, I forgot something important. Can you all please stand up? Because then, every, every time you get something wrong, you sit, and the, the survivor at the end is the ultimate winner of the game. Right? Oh, really? Oh, OK. Can we restart it? Maybe I can just close, reset. Let's see if it works again. Yeah. Oh, okay. So maybe, oh, maybe I know why. You may need to select the semester. That's a problem I had on my side. It, it, because it activated the next fall semester, you may need to select the spring semester. Is there any option? Yes. And if you select the spring semester, normally you should see it. Don't worry, I have, a, I have a fallback solution if it doesn't work. Yeah. So let me restart and see if it works. Oh, wow, there's definitely a bug in there. Yeah. Yeah. So take, take your time. If somebody can help you, can anybody help with FS18? Yeah. OK. So let me try this way. Who has something that is not working? OK, many of you. Let's do it the good old way. So the good old way means this is answer A. This is answer B. This is answer C. And this is answer D. Right? You saw there was a life before computers. We managed pretty well before. Well, you must produce a quantum entanglement of yourself distributed over the, over the cells. Oh, there is five answers. So the fifth one is uh, over there. So let's do, let's do it that way. There's not so many of you anyway. So hyperbolically is here. Logarithmically, here. Square root, right here, square root, linear, here, and exponential over there. So this is, this is square root. Are you logarithmic? Oh, you need, to, you need to separate so that it's clear. So this is square root, logarithmic. Do not think that, do, I don't know if you saw, I think it was French speaking Swiss TV. There was last week an experiment on TV where they played these games, but everybody was an accomplice except some persons. And then the accomplices would give wrong answers and they would observe is, if the persons being tested would actually also go under the social pressure and join everybody else. So who tells you that I don't have accomplices here? You know, they all went to square roots just in order to confuse you, right? Uh, anyway. So the right answer is square rootedly. So everybody who is here can stay. And uh, so you can continue to play and give answers, but uh, uh, 
uh, from, from your seats. So we, we are going to proceed. Yeah. It's only a game, right? <laughs> it's exactly like on, t on TV, you know this is, how, this is how it works. So square rootedly, remember this is, how is it called, this law? But no, no, stay with us, just don't go, I mean, it's not, it's not really, you, you can just come right here and, and, and just be with us. Um, so do you remember how it's called? Heap's law, exactly. So it was the exponent, and the other one is Tsip's law, which gives the, dif the distribution by, uh, of the frequencies of the, of the terms. Okay, let's now go to the next one. Why is the standard inverted index called inverted? Because it is always drawn topsy-turvy by convention, this is over there, because it maps terms to lists of documents, whereas the natural storage of a collection is a mapping from documents to terms, this would be over here, because documents are sorted in inverted order of term frequencies, this would be over here, and nobody knows this would be over there. Yeah. Yes? Oh, it's just an English expression. A friend of mine used that once, and I, I, I thought it was funny. Topsy-turvy just means uh, upside down, inverted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I realize that not having technology is, is, uh, is harder psychologically, because when you play with smartphones, you're hidden you know, be, be behind your smartphones, and nobody knows. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a different feeling to, uh, to, to eliminate. But really, I repeat it, I repeat it, this is only a game. The only thing is, you know, we have fun, and yeah, so um, that's interesting. Everybody is on the right answer, so everybody won. You can join us if you want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We don't have technology, so the smartphone app is not working, so okay. Um, which information retrieval technique is most adequate for evaluating this query, evaluating this query? Summer, end, not June, or sun? Language models over there. Boolean retrieval over here, ranked retrieval here, and probabilistic information retrieval over there. Yeah. So uh, what do you say? Boolean retrieval. Actually, I have an idea because I don't have any TA here, so why don't you two come over here and play against everybody else? Like, you know, you... <laughs> so you, like, exactly like the candidate on television. Sorry? Okay, as you wish, yeah. So let's just prepare for the exam. Let's like, look at the next one. So this is one you already saw. What is the most accurate definition of a type? Is it an equivalence class of tokens? And if two tokens appear in related documents, then the associated posting will appear only once for each term. Or is it the resulting set of a query expansion used to query the index? Or is it an equivalence class of documents which induces an equivalence class of to on tokens as well, called postings? Or is it an equivalence class of terms, types are associated with which, oh, with posting list in the standard inverted index? I hope I got that right now, because now I have a slide down. <laughs> yes, <laughs> perfect, yeah. Sorry? They all trust one person, yes, that's totally possible. Be very careful if, if the first person moves to the wrong answer, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, now, what is the do-week decimal classification? Is it the core algorithm used by Google to index the web? Or is it a number-based system used by many libraries in the world to store and retrieve, to sort and retrieve their books? Or is it a standard used by mathematicians to classify sets, N, Z, D, Q, R, C? This classification is also paramount to information retrieval as documents are encoded as numbers. Or um, do you issue query Dewey and decimal five classification? piped to curl exposts edu app app1dth.ch, which doesn't work today, apparently, this URL.
Okay, wow. You, you will have to share the chocolates in the end. <laughs> Yes, you are correct. Do we, you know, in the libraries, this five digit uh, system that we had before computers? Yeah, okay. Um, then I have this question. Which query returns documents five and eight right here? I have to zoom out, I think. Is it U and Y or U and not Y? Uh, five and eight. Five and, oh, sorry. Yeah. Five and eight. Let me zoom out again. Yeah. So you are Y, you are not Y, U and Y, U and not Y. So you say you and what? Yes? Yes? I'm asking for the query, so this is the incidence matrix, right? Exact, exactly five and eight, yeah. Mm -hmm. So are you on answer one or answer two? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. You are alone, right? No, you join the majority. Do you do you join under pressure or do you join because you, you think? Yeah? Okay. So the third one was correct. So now let's look at phrase queries. Do you remember how we can decrease the number of false positives with phrase, phrase queries by using byword indices? by using phrase indices with bigger tuples of words, by post-filtering the results, but there may still be some false negatives, or by using phrase indices with smaller tuples of words. I really say decrease, right? So we have uh, answer A over there, answer B, right? Answer C. Yeah. So is everybody final? Yes? Okay, so let me give the answer. Oh, let me ask actually over there. I, want, I, I feel so bad, you know, to, to just see you there just uh, because of the first question. So what do you say? Yeah. So before I ask that as an exam question, I will double check it with my, with my TAs. So yeah, you, you're absolutely correct in your analysis. So um, the, the, um, the idea is that uh, we do use keyword indices for, uh, for um, phrase queries. And I actually showed you the byword index, which is the, w the way you do phrase queries at all. So that, that's basically the starting point. So you're absolutely correct that it already decreases the number of false negatives compared to a simple index, like the standard index. Um, I think I probably picked here answer two because you can actually use three words, uh, qu four word indices, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. You are you are correct. So I think I will I accept both A and B. I think the the original um, location I asked that questions was after showing to you the by word indices, and then uh, then yeah. So you're absolutely correct. I accept your, uh, your, your answer. So we are going to accept both the, uh, the first and second. What about C? So by post-filtering the results. It's technically correct because if it's, you know, it's, it will decrease the number of votes, but it can't decrease. 
Hmm, let me. <laughs> now I, ha I have to, th to think of what I had in mind back then by post filtering the results. So, answer three, I remember now. Answer three is wrong because by post filtering, you will eliminate the false negatives compared to the query. So, this is the reason, right? So, sorry? Yeah. So, um, we, if you, if you, so here, what I mean with false negatives is in the context of the, 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 the algorithmic answer, like the phrase is really in the documents, so in terms of queries. So, if you do post filtering, you can eliminate 100%. Of the of the, the false negatives, you remember, for example, if you say, um, uh, yeah, uh, we have a result from our query, mm -hmm. and then it post filtered. So things that aren't already in the query cannot be added anymore afterwards. So we will have false negatives. Uh, oh, now I see. I meant false positives here. You're absolutely right. This is, this is what I love about this. You know, this kind, this kind of mistakes, actually, this is also one of the reasons why I don't proofread them completely for the quick clicker. It triggers this kind of discussions and this activates you. And it activates your critical thinking. And this is something that's very good. So um, I'm going to accept the three answers. <laughs> and we are going to move to the, to the next one. This is great. Yeah. Perfect. So, phrase queries with it. I really like that. I mean, you know, you probably heard ETH encourages critical thinking. It's all over the place, critical thinking, critical thinking. Continue to do that, especially when you work later in a company. Um, so now, this is a collection of documents. And we have to find the, oh, how am I going to display that without smartphones? Um, <laughs> this, is, this is going, well, you will have to use your memory. So which one of the following is the standard inverted index? There's A, B, C, and D here. <laughs> I mean the standard one. So let me show you slowly. So these are the documents. This is answer one, the standard inverted index. This is answer two. Yes, these are the documents, right? I'm using uh, A, B, C, and D as terms. So this was answer two, right here. This is answer, th answer three, and this is answer four. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> so now I'm turning, so I'm turning to you now. So do you have any critical thinking, something? Or do you agree on the answer? They all stand in the wrong place. Okay. Because that's number C and not number D. And they're all standing at D. Right? Mm. And I think this one, the top one, is correct. So let me show you the answers so you can explain to me. So this is, you're basically saying that uh, this, so this is the answer that, that your colleagues are on? Yeah? Mm -hmm. And you are, you are saying? So what? You, sorry? And I will be the one who was wrong. No, it's because standard inverted index is like, I thought. It's inverted. Yeah. It's inverted. It's the topsy turvy thing. So in a standard inverted index, you actually have the terms uh, or the types if you group them. You have the terms in here. And, uh, and then you have the documents in the posting lists. So, so this is why, exactly, yeah. So this is why it's not the inverted index, yeah. It's, you know, everybody makes mistakes, including me. I mean, you saw how I, I also made mistakes in my questions. It's totally, you should never, ever be afraid of making mistakes. This is how you learn. You will do many mistakes. I do many mistakes. This is the best way to learn from your mistakes. Um, so one, two, so definitely this is answer two, the correct one. Yeah, so this is the correct answer. So now, uh, phrase query index, postings compression. Why do we not, oh my God, the typos, why do we not use a fixed length encoding on gaps to compress postings? Because we can only use blocks of 32 bits, which is the size of a doc ID. This is over there. 
because the distribution of gap sizes is skewed. This is why you are. We do use fixed length encoding to compress postings. This is what we did in the lecture. This is over here. And the last one is a fixed length encoding can only be used on secondary gaps, gaps between gaps, because it can be centered around zero using an unsigned integer encoding. This is the answer D over there. So are you, are you thinking or are you already decided to stay here? Here, answer C. That, that's very, no, but it takes a lot of courage. Do, do you see that there is this very old movie with a jury of 12 people, and they all think that I think he's guilty or something? Sorry? Yeah, uh, was it this one? Uh, yeah, it's part, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I think I didn't recall the, the title. But exactly one of the members of the jury had an opposite opinion compared to, to everybody else, and he, he managed to flip everybody else's opinion. At the end, everybody agreed with him. So never be afraid if you think something is the right answer, and if you're wrong, it's absolutely not a problem, but always speak up. So let me ask over there. What do you think? <laughs> you think with the group pressure? Do you as well? You would take C as well, like your colleague right here. What would you, what would you say? You don't know? OK. So um, the correct answer is actually B. So the majority was right. Um, the fixed length encoding, this is the starting point before we compress. So when we compress, we use the document IDs, maybe on 32 bits. This is the correct implementation. Always start with the correct implementation. And the idea of the fix, the not using a fixed length encoding is that, remember, we encode gaps in, in the, in when we compress, right? We encode the gaps. The gaps, um, for many times, uh, there will be very small gaps, one, two, three, of IDs, and sometimes a very large gap. So if you take a fixed length encoding, the length of that fixed length you take must be that of the largest gaps. And if you think of the very rare terms, it's basically the number of bits that you need for your document size, the collection size. And then you will waste a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, space in order to store the small gaps. So this is the motivation for a variable length encoding. So the correct answer here was Answer two, so the majority was correct on that. Yeah, so we, it's, it's great because now we have a think tank that can basically contest maybe some of your decisions and, and disagree, right? So now, this one I think I already asked you earlier. Do you remember why we switched to inexact top K retrieval? Inexact means we don't necessarily have the exact top K uh, scores, but it still makes sense. So the first answer is because precision is irrelevant to ranked retrieval, only relevance of documents is. The second answer is because it leads to increased precision and increased relevance at the cost of being slower. The third answer is because cosine computation on vectors is already an approximation of reality. And the fourth answer is it does not make sense, critical thinking. Inexact top K retrieval doesn't make any sense if K, oh, sorry, it doesn't make sense if K is equal to Fibonacci numbers, but it makes a lot of sense for 10. Yeah. So we have everybody on, on C. So you're telling me that the cosine are approximation of reality, right? So what does the think tank say? <laughs> so sometimes it can actually um, jeopardize the, the question in itself because I need to be creative to make it credible. But I think that if I'm too creative, it's not credible anymore. So I think that here, it's definitely not credible anymore. But some, sometimes it actually works. You, you know that when you have multiple choice, the, the, you know, multiple choice exams, it's best for fairness because it ensures that everybody is graded in exactly the same way, which is one of the main motivations for using that. It's extremely hard to design. You wouldn't imagine the amount of time that you need to spend on a multiple choice. First, because you need to proofread for all the errors, much more than in clicker questions. And what is very hard is that multiple choices can be reverse engineered. 
And I'm not sure if you already watched TV and you saw a question with four answers. You didn't know the answer, but you could reverse engineer the thinking of those who asked the question and find the right answer. Right? So this is extremely hard to design multiple choice questions. Um, so you're absolutely correct that cosine, cosine computation is also un, always, sorry, already an approximation of reality. Yeah, I think we should take a break. So uh, remember that you are still in the game. Remember that you are in our big think tank, like the jury and, and criti criticizing the accuracy of the, of the answers. So I'll see you in uh, 15 minutes, and then we'll finish the questions, and we'll see who gets the, uh, the chocolate at the end. Come back, so come to the front over here. The microphone is working. Awesome. So I have corrected a few typos just to remember for the, for the next time and so that it's correct in the system. Um, so we will continue with everybody who is still in the game. So in exact copy, so you were mentioning Beatrice. I also didn't change that one to see. It's interesting because then it's either you mem you're trying to understand the question or maybe you have an eidetic memory and you actually already know the answer. So which one of the following data structures are a 3, 5, B plus 3? 3, 5, B plus 3. So this is answer 1. This is answer 2. This is answer 3. And this is answer four. Okay, so I'm waiting a little bit. So everybody here thinks that this one is a three five B plus three, right? Everybody here thinks this one. Yes, so this is B. This is where you are standing now. Then we have answer C, which is this one over there. And then we have answer D, which is over there. So A, let me show again, where you are here on this one. And you over there are on this one. It's very polarizing. That's very interesting. Yes? Again, don't, do not be sure. It's a very good exercise. If you change your mind, do not change your mind because of the majority. Change your mind because you truly believe that this is the correct answer. It's a very good exercise to resist the, uh, the majority. This is C. Uh, B plus 3, 3, 5, B plus 3. Here, 3, 5, B plus 3. So there is this one. This one where you are, this one, and this one. So is, are these these final answers? Are you playing as well? You want to play? Oh, you, ca you can come and pick. Uh, it's okay to be not sure. It's okay to make mistakes. I do as well. So do absolutely not be afraid. Yes? Yes. So this is answer A. This is answer B. This is answer C, and this is answer D. So do we have, do we freeze here? So the, we, we, it's right here, the cut, right? So A, B, okay. So now, let's go to our think tank. So, <laughs> so what is your opinion? On, you would say B? 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 Yes, this is correct. Let's discuss why now. So actually, maybe, uh, maybe one of you can tell us why answer B is correct. Uh, I, I just thought it might be A, but then I remembered that it, that it's not about how many elements there are in the list, but how many arrows you point out. Yeah, the children. And uh, on, on the lower one, from 6 to 10, there will be 6 arrows pointing out, which would violate the 3 to 5 and you just do. Yeah. And that's why I thought also that the, top, the single top node is allowed in there. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. C is definitely wrong because it doesn't have keys. That's a B tree. C is a B tree, yeah. So you are absolutely correct. So the problem here, you really have, do you remember this thing with the intervals? If you have 10 intervals, then you have 11, um, how do you call that? Um, 11 delimiters, right? So if you have 10 trees, you have nine intervals. Three to five really means the number of children. So here you have one, two, three, four, five, so that's fine. But three to five children means two to four keys, right, in the middle. And here we have more than four, we have five, right? So two to four, so this is not fine. This is not a three, five, B plus three. And this is indeed a B plus three, because you can see we have between two and four elements every time, and the root is fine, because we saw for the root, it's an exception. So the root can have less. This is a B tree, because we don't make the leaf special. B plus tree, we make the leaf special, right? Um, and uh, this one is not a B plus three because Yes, exactly, it's not balanced. So a B plus three must be perfectly balanced. You must have all the leaves at the same depth. Yeah, perfect. So this is good. So we have new think tank members over there. Yeah. yeah, I didn't realize when we started this and we switched from the smartphones to coming on the, on the front, I didn't feel, I didn't see how embarrassed I would be with the first eliminations and that's why I can't, I can't help repeating this is only a game. Uh, B plus three, so now evaluation measures. Uh, which one of these ratios did we not define as an evaluation measure? True positives over all returned results, true positives over all relevant documents, true negatives over all non-returned documents, and true negatives over non, all non-relevant documents. If you have a headache, that's normal, I have one too. And I needed to actually check it visually because I have a visual, a visual memory. So this is answer A, answer B, answer C, and answer D. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight contestants still in place. Again, think by yourself. Do not let yourself influenced by others. <laughs> so, do you all feel strong about your answer? And you were not influenced by others? None of you were, were influenced by others? <laughs> Absolutely sure, right? Okay. So, let's ac ask the think tank. So, what do you think? True negatives over all non-relevance documents. Okay, what you would say? Would you say? Yes. I would say D as well. D. As well? <laughs> D. <laughs> D. <laughs> no, I'm wondering. Do you do that because of the majority pressure? Like we have the think tank majority pressure now. This is interesting. <laughs> so, what do you say? <laughs> so you say. D, okay. Okay. How about you? Sorry? Oh, that's, that's fine. You can tell us what you, what you think. You can tell us what you think. Oh, you were not in the lecture last time. That's fine, yeah. Mm -hmm. You say D as well? And uh, you also say D? C, yes, very good. We have somebody who resists the majority. So, so let's go one by one. True positives over all returned results. What is it called? So you say C or D now? D? 
D as well. Okay, so now let's go one by one. So it's not A indeed because A is called. Yes? Precision, Precision exactly. Where in what you return, how, how much is correct. The second one, true positives over all relevant documents, the one you should return, what is it called? Recall, yes. Uh, true negatives over all non-returns documents. And true negatives over all non-relevant documents, one of them is specificity. And now I even have to think because I'm having that headache as well. So, so specificity I think is D. True negatives over all non-relevant documents is specificity. You look at non-relevant documents, how many of those do you successfully not return? So I think it's answer C. Let me check. Yeah, that's answer C. So do you agree this was specificity? It's the opposite of recall. Recall is how successfully did you return relevant documents? Specificity is how successfully did you not return non-relevant documents? Right, so now we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven contestants, yes. Are you still, uh, are you also in the group? Are you also in, still playing? Yeah, so we have seven, seven people right here. Um, <laughs> let's now go to something that I want to do very precisely because even I sometimes by mistake confuse the two. What's the difference between bigram indices or k-gram and by word versus, uh, or k-words indices? They don't differ. If you think they don't differ, it's over here. Or do you think that k-gram indices are, indexes, are, index, are indexing sequences of k characters and k-word indices sequences of k terms, which is right here? Or um, and, and used for phrase search, k-gram indices and k-word indices for tolerant retrieval. Answer C is the same thing, but swapping tolerant retrieval and phrase search. And answer D is that k-gram indices do not exist uh, because they're only used for generating Markov chain-based language models from documents, which you guess is made up, but anyway. <laughs> I, I, I'm too conspicuous in the way that I make up things. I will, I will need to find a, a different way. So you are on answer C, but is it just because you stayed here or because <coughs> you feel strong on answer C? 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 C is good? Okay. What do you think, the think tank? Do you think it's D? <laughs> Sorry? C? Yes? C? C? Okay. Yeah, this is correct. So again, the, the way in my brain, by word and uh, K words and K gram is the same idea that you have these sequences of k things, but just in one case it's characters, in the other case it's terms. And indeed, if you are using k, uh, k characters, it's basically sub-words inside a word. This is for spell check. It's for spell check and looking uh, about the spelling of words, tolerant retrieval. K words is for phrases. You're trying to identify a phrase, but the index, the, 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 the essence of the index is very similar. So indeed, that was answer three. Um, now, I'm asking to you, which one is the correct base formula? So we have everybody on D. It's very interesting because when we play this way, as opposed to smartphones, there is a much stronger resilience to, to, uh, to the game. So it's very much harder to find a winner. Okay, so you are on B, right? You're on answer B. So now, what do you say? Is answer B correct, or do you think it's something else? B is correct, everybody, okay. Let's see. Yeah, that is correct. Uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so it's very easy to remember because the, if you really have condition on A, so you must be time A and then you get the conjunction A and B, and when you divide by B again, you find this. So this is how, how I remember that. All the rest is um, just incorrect. Uh, 
So remember, this formula actually converts, um, it, it, it uh, swaps A and B. It's a way of, uh, if you want to find out if A is true, knowing B, and you have the data in the opposite direction, then this is how you link the two of them. This is like a wizard that allows you to swap. It's very useful uh, to make statements about things that you cannot really measure, when, like the likelihood of extraterrestrial life, these kind of things. So Bayes is then very useful. Um, now, I mean, you're computer scientists, you probably all know that, but what is a Google? So do you think answer B, the original code name of the web? No idea. Oh, what, the, what is the, so Google is the search engine, right? But what, why is it called Google? What, is, what does Google mean? Yeah, B, OK, yeah. And uh, so what do you think over there? So. It's not, oh, it's none of these. Yeah, very, so original, an original statement. Yes? Because one power of 100 is one. It's not normal. Oh, my, yeah. Okay, yeah, it's 10 to the power of 100. Yeah, I, I completely, okay, I agree. I completely messed up that one. That's fine. I, may, I meant 10 to the power of, uh, of 100. So good. Can you can you repeat? So my idea was, if you, like, I know that the Google is like a huge number. Yeah. But I realized that lots of numbers is not that number. Yes, yes, yes. No, okay, it's fine. Let me correct it right now. So I. Isn't it written differently? Yes. Yeah. It's a go. It's a Google. Yeah. <laughs> let me let me just fix it for next time. So it's ten to the power of a hundred. It's not an exam question, right? And that's. Uh, like this? Like this? Like this? Yeah. I will look it up. I, I will look it up. G like this. <laughs> like this? <laughs> like this? I, I will. I will. <laughs> I will Google it. Yeah. That's wrong. I will Google it. I will Google it. <laughs> yeah, I will. Okay. So let's move on to the next one. How do we make precision and recall work on rank retrieval? You remember that. Precision and recall is defined on sets. So how does it work on rank retrieval? If you think we can't make it work because it only works on sets, it's over there. Uh, if, you, if you think it can be redefined for inexact top K retrieval by comparing it with exact top K, it's answer B. Uh, if you think we adapt precision and recall to weighted scores, that's here. And if we go down the results and draw a curve plotting precision against an increasing recall, it's over there. Could be made up. I mean, it, suspect it, it's, it sounds like something made up. Or does it? <laughs> or does it? Yes, we have a critical thinker over there. No, I'm just, I'm just, I don't really get the question. Um, so let me, let me rephrase it. So when I defined precision in recall, I did it in terms of sets. We classify the documents in four, in two by two, in a two by two matrix. One dimension is relevant, non-relevant, based on some people that we asked, and the other dimension is return, not returned. And then you remember that we define precision, recall, and specificity um, in terms of we divide the cardinality of the sets. It's ratios of the, the number of elements in the sets. But in the case of ranked retrieval, we don't have sets. We, we, we ask, we rank results, right? So you don't have sets anymore. How do you make it work? How can you even define precision and recall in that context is the question. It is informal. How, how, we, 
how do we adapt the concept of precision and recall on ranked ret in a ranked retrieval setting? Yeah. Okay. So let's look at the answer. How, what do you think it is? Any of you? Who thinks C? Yes? Who, who thinks it's answer D? Yes, you think it's answer D. Do you, do you feel strongly that it's answer D? You think, you think so or you're strongly thinking so? So you think this is answer D, right? Does anybody else thinks th think that this is answer D? Yes, you do, right? Does anybody else think answer D? Well, it is actually answer D. So we have a winner. I mean, it's really nice that it happened that way because it shows how you really have, must have the courage if you think something, and even if the majority thinks differently, have the courage of speaking up and say so. So congratulations. What is your name? Chris. Chris. Yeah. So Chris is the winner. We are going to continue to down the, the other questions, so now you can all come back or uh, we, are, we don't have so many left. So what is not a difference between Boolean retrieval and ranked retrieval? So maybe we can raise hands, it's the, it's the easiest. So who thinks that it's answer A, which is not, it's incorrect, basically. You're looking for the incorrect uh, different statements. So who thinks that A is incorrect? Who thinks that B is incorrect? Who thinks that C is incorrect? Two answers there. Uh, and who thinks that answer D is incorrect? Yes, we, t we have the majority, and indeed this is answer D. So instead, in, we do have Boolean is a set of word model. Ranked retrieval, bag of words. You're looking at term frequencies with the bag of words. You don't have term frequencies in the set of words, of course. Then the sets of results. Yes, Boolean retrieval returns the set of results. This is how we can define precision and recall just by counting what is in the sets. Ranked retrieval has lists of results. You're technically ranking all documents of the collection in decreasing order, and then you have an arbitrary cutoff where you say, I want the top 10 or something. And this is why, remember, just to come back on the previous question, this curve basically means that you start with k equals one, and you compute precision and recall, and then two, three, you make it increase, and this is how you get the curve, where you have the recall that increases as you return more documents, and the precision decreases, typically. Well, it doesn't always decrease, but you basically then fix the curve by taking the, the max just to make it a decreasing curve, so it's more of a fix. Then the third one, a Boolean query language only makes sense for Boolean retrieval. You know this very simple grammar, and, or, not? You cannot have that for ranked retrieval. Ranked retrieval uses the query as a set or a bag of words. Right? So you, you do the evidence accumulation, so the way you compute your cosine, you, you go through the index and you accumulate your score in the documents. So this is why you cannot have a Boolean query language for ranked retrieval. Uh, you can on Google, but it's because it's a mix. So Google is, is mixing a lot of things. And the fourth answer is made up. Hilbertian indices do absolutely not exist. We do have some algebra with the cosine computation. Uh, who understands that computing the cosine, the scalar product, is a very good uh, way of computing a score? You do, right? It's the similarity measure. Um, so it, is some, it has to do with algebra and vector spaces, but the thing is we use exactly the same structure as the inverted index, where we add some numbers here and there, and then you just scan the index, either term at a time or document at a time, and then you accumulate the score, which is the, you basically compute the scalar product as a, as a sum of terms. So this is why answer D is wrong, okay? Question. Yes? What is natural text queries? Uh, natural text queries is just type words. It's the way you type under Google, that most people type under Google. Like you search for uh, ETH Zurich, you just say ETH Zurich. You don't say ETH and Zurich, which would be the Boolean query. Mm -hmm. um, 
Then we have, oh, I'll keep that for the end, the Bertrand's bo box paradox, it's really nice. So here, I made, a new, I made up a new one, so you didn't see that one before. So these are, what are these? One, four, and five, what are these? It's a posting list, so one, four, and five are? Not gaps, these are document IDs, right? But you're already starting to give the answer, which is very good, yeah. So these are document IDs, document one, document four, document five, and it's associate, associated to some term, and now you want to compress it with the gamma codes. So which is your compressed, your compressed gamma code? I realize now that you can even answer that intuitively <laughs> because the compression is pretty good. So who thinks it's answer A? Okay, who thinks it's answer B? Okay, who thinks it's answer C or D? Okay, so what are C and D? Fixed length encoding. Or it could be a variable length encoding as well. If you, if you, it's a special case basically because we don't have too big numbers. But yes, this is the natural binary fixed length encoding. And now what's the difference between answer A and answer B? Can you decrypt answer B? So you probably notice that answer A is exactly the numbers there, right? We have zero, that's one. Then we have one, one, zero, 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 which is the encoding of four. You know how to decode, right? If I say, if I, if I say one, one, zero, 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 you know you have two ones and it stops, so you need exactly two more bits, so you know you stop here. And then you take that part and add a one in front, and you get four. Okay, so this is how you decrypt a gamma code. So you have exactly one, four, five, eight, if you look at it, but what is encoded right here? So we have one then. So that's, yeah, these are the gaps. It's one, three, one, three, two, five, one, four. These are the gaps. So now do you think it's answer A or B? It's answer B, right? Because we encode the gaps. We want to encode the gaps. You see how it's shorter? By encoding the gaps, you will have many shorter numbers, right? As opposed to encoding the original document IDs. So remember, we encode the gaps. This is very important. Then we have uh, phrase queries. No, this one is because I corrected them. Um, I think I just corrected them. Okay, so now let's finish with this one. This is a tricky one. It's called the Bertrand's box, box paradox. It's actually very simple to solve. It's solvable in one line, but you need to write the, the, the right line. So there's three boxes. Let me represent them. So we have one box with which have two Luxemburger lists. That's box A, I think. A, two Luxemburger lists, yes. The finest. You need to eat them within 24 hours for them to be the uh, tastiest. Then we have a uh, second one is two Toblerone. So we have T and T, that's box B. And then we have L and T, that's box C. You pick one box, you don't see what's inside. You pick one, you go home. Then you open that box at home, and you pick one of the two randomly, that's a Luxemburgerly. Now the question is, what else do you have in your box that you take home with you, that you took home with you? So do you think the probability that the other one is also a Luxemburgerly is one third, one half, two thirds, or one? You, all know, you already know what formula to use here. Does anybody know the formula? Okay, we have one half here. Who else thinks it's one half? Yes, very good. Who doesn't think it's one half? Very good, we have our critical thinker, the winner here. You think it? You think a third, one third, not two thirds, one third, okay? 
Do you think also one third, two thirds? You think so? That's great because we have all answers. You change to two thirds now, right? You have two thirds. So we have one half, two thirds, and one. Let's now that we have all of these on the table. Let's try to vote right here. Who still thinks it's one half? Okay. Who thinks it's two thirds? You built a lot of credibility by winning the game, right? So now <laughs> people are following you. So two thirds. And now who thinks it's one? So you know with certainty. Okay. Well, the answer is two thirds. So you're absolutely correct. But what's interesting is how you figure that out. And now I hope I get that correctly because it's not, it's not so easy. So uh, now I, my memory is getting blank. So basically, the idea is that if you look at the uh, Luxembourger here, you had, knowing that it's, uh, no, knowing the box, you have a chance of one of picking it if it's box box A and a chance of one half of picking it if it's box C. Let me try to write it down. So we are looking for, for the probability that the other one, so that x2 is L, knowing that x1 is L. I think I'm, my memory is going blank right now, so I'm not even sure I, I'm going to, uh, to get it right. But let me try nevertheless. Um. Ah, I think I don't have it right. I did, I did it at home, but... Uh. So I can explain it informally. And then we, we can work together. Maybe we find together the, uh, the base formula to use. But the idea is here. If, uh, if you look at, you have a Luxembourger Lee, and you take it upside down, then there is one third of probability that you were actually in box C, and two thirds that you were actually in box A. Right? If you, if you conditions, so, oh yeah, I, I got it now. This is why, what I did wrong in the base formula. Uh, let me take. So the probability that we are looking for, that the other one is a Luxembourg early, is nothing else than the probability we picked box A, right? That's the same thing. It's the probability that we had box A. Because if we had box C, then the other one is a Toblerone. And this cannot happen. So what we are looking is, what is the probability that our box, let me use lowercase just to uh, distinguish the random variables. So the box was box A, knowing that what I took, so the one that I picked randomly, was a Luxembourger Lee. And now I can turn that upside down with the base formula. So I get the probability that x equals L, knowing that a small l just to make sure it's a, a true variable knowing that b equals a, multiplied by what? Yeah. yeah, and divided by? Divided by? Yeah, x equals l. And now we can compute that. So this is what we want. It's very hard to compute. So now, what's the probability that b equals a? One third, because we picked the box at random. Let me use colors. So the probability that we picked this box is one third. What is the probability that we picked a Luxembourg early? It's a joint probability, right? It's first one third for picking the box, and then one half within the box, right? So if you look at the joint space, box plus one or two, and you look at all the possibilities, how, how, many, how, how big is our space of all the possible candies we may have had? Six, right? There are six possibilities. It's a uniform distribution, right? It's one third uh, multiplied by one half for each, and half of them are Luxembourgerly, so there's a chance of one half, right? This is what you wanted to say? 
So the, the odds that we get a Luxembourger Lee is one half because half of the candies are Luxembourger Lee's and it's all uniform. So this is one half. And now what is the probability that if the box is actually A, the probability that we have a Luxembourger Lee? It is one. So now all you need to do is the math. So what, what does that give to you? Two thirds, right? Exactly. This gives to you probability of two thirds. This is the Bayesian solution. And that's just math. All you need to do is this magic. So this is the magical part. And, uh, but white magic, because it's real math. And then all you need to do is compute. And really the idea why this works is that these are easy to compute and give you the fourth one. Who understands this? Who agrees? Very good. So this is known as the Bertrand box paradox. It's very counterintuitive, right? Your first thought was one half. And then if you start computing stuff, it's two thirds. So uh, very good. So, so the probability of one, we're explaining. So can you explain this? I think you said one. It's conditioned, right? Yeah, you're welcome. So uh, this is it. We are ending on this beautiful paradox of uh, probabilities. Um, there is that uh, you, you will have a few more minutes uh, back. So if you are interested, go to uh, CHNG22, to David's, uh, David Cox group, and uh, you can ask any questions you have. You can also send any emails. Do not hesitate to send emails. Uh, if anything is unclear and anywhere in the lecture. Um, and then that's pretty much it. So um, good luck for the exam to you all. Don't forget that the two hours and a half is for you to have more time. It's actually 90 minutes, mostly multiple choice. Uh, it's always very, uh, a lot of emotions for me when I, when I uh, uh, stop a lecture. So thank you very much for being such a great audience. I hope that you enjoyed uh, the lectures just as much as I enjoyed teaching them because I love teaching. And uh, maybe see you um, another time in, uh, in another lecture around. So good luck preparing for your exam.